Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the DD Geopolitics podcast. I am joined by my guest host, Tyler, and our guest for today is Elijah Manye. Elijah, how are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. It's great to be with you. This is the second time Elijah's been on the show. Elijah is a French journalist calling in from France, and Tyler is my guest host from Canada. Tyler, how are you today? I'm doing great. Pleasure to be here. So, Elijah, um, how have you been? I don't think that I've spoken to you since, gosh, I think it was the winter time, actually. Well, I've been doing well, really, but the world I don't think is doing as well as I am. <laughs> no, the world's <laughs> not doing that great. <laughs> so I think- there, are multiple, there are multiple issues going on, that's for sure. No, there's only a few. There's just a few. They're all pretty minor. They're all pretty minor. Everything's going everything's going well in the world. Um, so let's talk about uh since you're in France, I did want to talk about Africa. So we do know that the Francophone Africa is the mostly the Sahel is in quite a bit of turmoil between coups and um, you know, Wagner's there, an upsurge in terrorist attacks as well. And Victoria Newland doing a few drive-bys, which is never good. Um, yeah, that's usually a, sig- a signal that things are going south. Yes. Um, but Elijah, what as someone who lives in France and is French, how do you feel? Uh, do you see this as um, some people say, oh, it's more of the same. Um, it's just another coup in Africa. And then other... Africans that I've spoken to have said, no, this time is different. Um, how does it, does, do the French, does it, are there any reverberations in France? Is this something that's being talked about? Well, I don't want to sound complicated, but you can't talk about what's happening in Africa, between France and Africa, without including what happened in Syria in 2015, in Ukraine in 2022. Uh, the outcome of the BRICS, uh, the Shanghai Corporation, the um, uh, G77 plus China in uh, Cuba, Havana, and, and the latest development in Africa itself with the coup d'etat in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. That's why I'm saying I don't want to sound complicated, but we have to link all these events together because they are. Now, For your first question, for the um, general French uh, in the street, people are not very educated in geopolitics. And when I say people is not the majority, we're talking about only the elite. It's similar to the US, uh, where only a selective people who are interested in what's happening in the world. And all the others swallow the mainstream media or are really careless about the event in the world, as long as they don't tackle and attack their uh, pension, the uh, health insurances, the uh, education, and their yearly holiday during the summer. Uh, But why I went to 2015 to talk about Africa is because in 2015, this is when for the first time, President Vladimir Putin challenged the uh, U.S. unilateralism in Syria. And by going to Syria, uh, Russia spoiled the plans of the U.S. and NATO, who are still occupying northeast Syria, to change the system and to um, create a failed state in Syria after the occupation of Iraq and then to move on to Lebanon, and then from Lebanon to Iran, exactly like General Wesley Clark told us that the Americans were planning to occupy seven countries in five years, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, uh, uh, Afghanistan, um, Afghanistan, Sudan, uh, and Libya. So all these countries, um, the, the, the series of occupying all these countries, have been halted in Syria. And because of that, I don't think the Americans and NATO swallowed that. And because of the war in Syria, because the Americans did not manage to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad, and Iran was there along with the Russians, 
Iran with his allies, of course, and that created a beginning of a shift in the world, where for the first time since 1981, and here I meant the perestroika and the fall of the Soviet Union and the change that Russia has decided to undertake, uh, this is when for the first time the Americans are challenged. So because America was challenged, then uh, the, Russia was uh, understood that the Americans don't really want them. Even if Russia was part of NATO, not as a member, but it was invited to NATO and was participating to the NATO meetings in Brussels, was part of the G7 that became the G8, and uh, Russia was trying to integrate itself in the international community and saying, don't be afraid, I have nothing to do, I am open, I'm doing business commerce, I'm building my strengths again, but not to scare you, but to work together. Now, we have seen Lavrov and John Kerry at that time cooperating, but luckily to, for the world, and I say luckily now to explain why, the Pentagon refused this cooperation and rejected a cooperation in Syria between Russia and the US. And this is why the Americans continue ahead with their plan with NATO by occupying Northeast Syria. And the plan was, uh, and that the Americans and NATO started, is to kick out Russia from having access to the warm water in the, in the Mediterranean uh, uh, from its base in Tartus, Syria. Now, because of that reason, we understand that the Americans started first to remove Russia from the Middle East. And then the Russia accepted this challenge and went there without raising the stake and saying, well, let us limit it to here, a differences in Syria, but nothing else. However, the Russian understood where the Americans were going. And this is why we have seen in 2021, when President Putin, according to Secretary General, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg, sent a letter saying, don't come to Ukraine and don't bring uh, NATO to Ukraine and Ukraine as a member of NATO, Otherwise, I will respond by attacking Ukraine. And of course, Jan Stoltenberg told us that the NATO refused the proposal because the Americans and NATO thought that this is going to be another Afghanistan. What the world was missing is Russia was prepared for the worst and didn't want to go to Ukraine and waited until um, February 2022 even if the CIA director told us that the Russian troops were on the border of Ukraine in April 2021, but we uh, were delighted because we wanted the Russian to be involved, thinking that this is where we can defeat and cripple the Russian economy. So because of that, and because this guts from President Putin to challenge the US hegemony and to continue this challenge, this is why we see the consequences happening in the Gulf, in West Asia, in Central Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America. And this is where I come to your question. So in Africa, we have seen um, a race by Europe, by Russia, by China, by the Americans toward Africa, where there is a potentiality and where the African can feel that they no longer under the European colonialism. There is no worse human being on earth like the white man, because we have, in particularly in Europe, killed the African, enslaved the African, stole all their resources, and think that we can still continue with this same mindset and think we can steal the Russian uh, resources and then defeat Russia and take all its resources they divided among us, and then continue doing the same in Africa, which would have been the case had Russia uh, been defeated in Ukraine. Because Russia was not defeated in Ukraine, then we have seen the African responding. First, they rejecting the US and uh, Europe and Western sanction on Russia. Secondly, in St. Petersburg, 48 leaders, president and representative of uh, the leadership in Africa, uh, 48 out of 54 
countries were present at the meeting with President Putin, again, confirming that they are not the enemy of Russia and they want Russia to continue working with Africa. China is already in Africa. The US understand that they, they cannot beat the Chinese. The Chinese are unbeatable because they have constructed 6,000 kilometers of railway, 6,000 kilometers of motorway, 48 harbors refurbished and new. They've cons uh, constructed hundreds of hospitals, of uh, schools, uh, of uh, electric power. This is why they are unbeatable because the Americans can't match what the Chinese are offering to the African. And the African are saying, we welcome any competition. So this is why we have seen a coup d'etat in Mali and Burkina Faso and in Niger, that was the last one, and saying to the French, out. And why is that? Simple reason. If you look of, uh, at what France is buying of Niger, Niger is producing, is exporting 20% of the French uh, uranium and selling it uh, for 87 cents the kilo, when Canada is selling it for $200 a kilo. So the difference really between 30 to $50 billion a year that we are stealing from Niger and we're not giving Niger it's the money that it deserves exactly the same that we buying it from Canada. And that is putting France in deep trouble because France sells electricity from its nuclear uh, power to many European countries, and we can no longer exploit the African. So it is right for the African to say to the French, get out of the country, we don't want you, because they simply they had 500 years of experience of European colonialism, and they've seen what the Europeans have offered to Africa, why Africa is still so poor, or, although it is one of the richest continent in the world, because of how we have dealt with the Africans, population and uh, natural resources. And what's happening today in Niger, there are three French bases, the uh, People in Niger and the leadership are insisting for France to evacuate these spaces. They will end up evacuating these spaces because they can't stay in a hostile environment where the country doesn't want them and the population don't want them and they want them out. And they will be kicked out. Now, it doesn't mean that the French influence had disappeared from Africa. It will take time, but this time is going to come because of the BRICS, because of Shanghai, because of the G20, they want to include Africa uh, as a member, because of the G77 in Cuba that includes Africa, because everybody now, the global South is reorganizing itself to say to the Americans and the European, to the West, your sanctions are crippling the population. Today, we have an alternative. I did like that you brought up Syria and Ukraine and how it's intertwined with Africa because, uh, and I'm a, 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 many people may not know, but I am a very big Bashar al-Assad fan. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, uh, big, <laughs> huge. I am the Bashar al-Assad fan, but um, I, people don't realize that when he wasn't overthrown how much of a wrench that threw into the plans of the West. So now, um, and I, I, I'd like to touch on the fact that uh, the arms and uh, the proliferation of arms that are being set, that are said to be heading to Ukraine are actually heading to these other regions as well. Um, and the fact that uh, I have my own suspicions about Turkey's involvement in the grain deal, but we do know that the grain, that the ships that were involved in the grain deal were also being used to transport weapons and that these weapons have now wound up in uh, Syria and then filtered themselves down south into the Sahel. So now we see these, uh, the uptick in the terrorist attacks in the Sahel and it's kind of throwing, the whole thing is just a huge wrench in, in the West's plans to kind of keep, at least keep Africa subdued also wanted to ask if you have any thoughts of whether um, the United States is behind some of this turmoil in order to get the French, the French out of Africa. 
Um, I don't think so, but the United States is delighted to see France out because first of all, it reduces the French influence in Africa. Secondly, it reduces the French influence in Western Europe. And thirdly, it gives a, a good sense for the US to move its relationship uh, from uh, considering that the representative of Europe are France and Germany and move it to Poland and all the Eastern European countries who are much more obedient to the US policy and uh, strategy uh, worldwide than the French, the Italian, and the German. So by seeing France struggling in Africa, so what is left of France? Why France should be more powerful than any other European country or any other Western country that is considered the US ally? First of all, France uh, tried to express some rebellion from uh, Emmanuel Macron in 2018 when he said NATO is brain dead. Secondly, the same Macron said that he wanted a European army to fight against all the enemy of Europe, including the United States. So we have seen that Macron lies all the time, changes his mind all the time, uh, change his alliances from saying I am the ally of President Putin and then sending weapons to Ukraine and want to stop uh, Russia from uh, attacking Ukraine and uh, participating to the uh, to fueling the war between Russia and the United States in Ukraine. So we have seen a real uh, weakness in France in the last couple of years. Uh, not only in Africa, but also in Europe. And uh, these consequences are going to weigh heavily on Western Europe, particularly that Europe is known uh, with its richness due to the, what, uh, the, uh, what the Europeans have stolen from Africa and due to their industry. But now, because we have decided that we want to no longer buy the Russian oil directly, but we pay more for it by buying the Russian oil through India, just to confirm how stupid we are. And um, we continue buying the uranium uh, from Russia, as the United States is uh, the biggest buyer of uranium from Russia, but it is permitted for the Americans, is not permitted for us. So everything under the table is ongoing at a higher price, weighing heavily on the economy and the industry. And when this happens, then it means more taxes on the population, which is the case. Macron invented a new tax on uh, housing now. So if you don't live in a house more than six months, you have to pay a tax or you rent it or you live in it, whatever. And they inventing all the time new taxes uh, left, right, and center, although the price of oil and gas hasn't increased, but all the other prices and the price of food and the value of the euro has decreased tremendously, which shows that Europe is um, looking now for an alternative, but it is impossible to find anything unless we change the model. The model that the West has been offering to the world is a belligerent one. We have attacked Afghanistan for 20 years. And when I say we, it is the US and NATO, and Europe is part of the NATO, like all the other 31 countries now. So uh, we attack Afghanistan. After 20 years, we want to, we removed Taliban from Kabul, but not from the country. And we gave the country back to the Taliban. We attacked Iran. We killed a million people. And now the Iraqi want us out. And we thought we bring in um, sense by looking for weapons of mass destruction that were never there. And we thought that we can bring our culture, our democracy. This is, well, I mean, that's very irrelevant when we talk democracy because we're not living in democracy, but that's another topic. And uh, the um, Iraqi are doing extremely well without us. We have allowed ISIS to proliferate according to Hillary Clinton. The people we're fighting today are the same people we have funded. So uh, we destroyed Syria. 
We still occupy North East Syria. This, uh, we destroy Libya. And this is the model that we have offered to the world in the last 20, 30 years. Now, when we see the Chinese, and many people are skeptical about the Chinese uh, and the Russian, and we see the Russian and the Chinese saying, well, we have another model to offer. We don't want to come with our weapons, take your country. Let's do business. Let's link the continents together. Let's create the link between the harbor, between the land road, between the railway. Let us bring prosperity to other countries so we can make money and you can make money and uh, create a real prosperity when you need it. And that is a very dangerous model that the Chinese and the Russians are offering to the world that contradict everything that we've been hiding behind, particularly saying the Western value. It's a big word, but our values are really fake. And um, today, they are much less ignorant in the world who have alternative uh, information, have access not only to mainstream media, and can read what's happening to the world and reach their own conclusion that we have only created havoc in the world for the last 20, 30 years. And uh, today, we have a serious competition. This is why everybody is going toward Asia and toward Africa. And we see in less than two months, a Shanghai Cooperation meeting, Ch uh, BRICS meeting, G20 meeting, G77 meeting. So, so many gatherings, suddenly everybody wants the prosperity of the world, which is a good thing. I hope they continue in this line. Yeah, I found it very interesting to... Uh... I mean, that's a lot of information you just Im imparted there, but I, I find it very interesting that uh, if we look at all of these supposed humanitarian invent interventions militarily, we see that, um, you know, it's primarily the citizens of these countries who have suffered, not necessarily the combatants of those countries that we've entered. So if we look at Afghanistan, we look at Iraq, we look at Syria, you know, it's civilians that take the brunt of the casualties. And um, and after the fact, uh, places like Libya, Afghanistan, um, in any place where we've intervened, uh, especially Iraq, the rebuilding process is either slow or non-existent. Uh, in Libya, it's definitely non-existent. Um, do you see that uh, Russia, China, I, I think specifically in this case, China, is offering not only uh, opportunities for trade, but also infrastructure building, which I think is so important to the African continent? Well, to be honest, Russia opened the way to the world to challenge the U.S. unilateralism. Otherwise, nobody would have dared to challenge the United States. And by challenging the United States, and what we see today, according to what the Pentagon told us, 50 nations are sitting in an operational room with all the head of uh, the military investing in all their uh, intelligence resources, the logistic and the uh, weapon industry to send to Ukraine and to fight Russia and Russia is still holding, and Russia is still fighting back, which gave us, which gave the whole world the possibility to challenge the U.S. and say, well, after all, it is possible to challenge the U.S. because one country today is facing 50 other countries on one soil. And of course, we can't say that all these 50 countries are going to send boots on the ground because then the Russian will use their nuclear weapons and then it will become a nuclear war, because this is not the case. It is a proxy war, but all these 50 countries are investing everything they can. We heard uh, Ursula von der Leyen saying that we need to keep up with our industry that is doing the best to send weapons to Ukraine and to continue sending ammunition because our strategic warehouses are empty which means that Russia alone challenged the U.S. and was capable of doing so. By doing so, it opened the road to all the other countries. Look at Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. They are the best U.S. allies. In the last meetings, first, 
they reduced the oil production by 2 million barrels when Russia wanted to reduce it by 1 million. But by reducing 2, billion, 2 million, uh, Russia is delighted because that will keep the price of oil uh, high as it is. Secondly, the uh, Saudis increased again another cut by another million. And the, we're talking about uh, taking major step against the US policy that wanted an increase of oil production. Secondly, for Russia, for uh, Saudi Arabia to say, I am starting to uh, rely on my uh, uh, local currency and deal with the UN and the ruble in all the transaction with Russia and China, that's another big hit to the US dollar, which is more painful than the military hit. Because if you hit the US dollar, you hit the US uh, empire and you dethrone the US. That is also very important. And that only due to the challenge that Russia accepted from the West and engaged in Ukraine. So we see all these European and American allies. We go to, to India. India refused to impose sanctions on Russia and said, my policy is to look after the benefit and the interest of the of Indian population and not the American population. This is exactly what Viktor Orban, Prime Minister of Hungary, did in the middle of Europe and saying, I'm sorry, no, I can't um, uh, accept sanctions on Russia because I need their oil and gas and I depend on that and I will not join the EU in their sanctions. So that is the division among the EU. When we see that and we see Austria never stop buying gas and oil from Russia, then we see the EU is not united. Because you, the EU is not united, because the Russian accepted the challenge, because the uh, West is not managing to defeat Russia and to cripple its economy, because China is rising, then Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, India, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Egypt, Iran joined in, all these countries started to breathe and saying, well, we don't want to, we're not the enemy of the US, but we today, we have another alternative. And that big favor that Putin did to the world started from the gate of Russia, of uh, Syria, and opened up completely in Ukraine, where I think it is not that the Americans were just uh, shaking their hands happy because they brought Russia into the Ukrainian quagmire, but because they were idiot to accept that Russia goes to war and then start losing their prestigious position on the head of the world. And today, uh, the African uh, leaders are saying, we want to continue dealing with Europe, we want to continue dealing with the West, with the Americans, but we have the Chinese and the Russian come and keep compete with them. And Russia, yes, has a lot to offer to Africa as it has to offer to the Middle East. And I think the Russian needs to move away from not only sending, uh, exporting oil and gas and weapons, but also to be more heavily in involved and compete in the in constructing in the infrastructure of countries in need, like we're talking about Jordan, talking about Iraq, talking about Lebanon, talking about Turkey. Russia is constructing the nuclear facility in Turkey, is uh, uh, creating in Turkey a hub for the gas that can be distributed to the rest of Europe and to the Middle East where it is needed. So all that Russia is today, I think Russia was in need of this war to modernize itself, to open up more, to liberate itself from always trying not to upset the Americans and to open all more horizons for the world, particularly Africa, uh, Middle East, and Latin America, and here I mean the global south. So what I, I see when I look at the geopolitical situation right now, um, with the rise of Africans saying, you know, we want the neocolonialists out, um, I, I see that there's a real concern about how the West uses the lack of investment into infra infrastructure, which is desperately needed across Africa, 
uh, I think they, the attempt by the West is to hold them down and keep them sort of in their place. If, if you remember, uh, Borel said something about, uh, you know, the, the golden billion, meaning Europe and, and uh, North America, and the savage garden, meaning those outside of it, the, the, the jungle, and that Europe was the garden and that they had to, you know, keep the wild ones out. Um, and, and we can see that, that it's been a very paternal sort of um, relationship that France has had with its uh, colonies, if you will, in Africa. Um, do you see that the, or do you think that it has been in the best interests of the neocolonists uh, to hold Africa down, not invest in that infrastructure, to fund different um, rebel factions in order to keep instability there in inside of Africa? Yes, it was, because how can we steal the uranium from Niger and buy it for 87 cents when it costs $200? and pay 220 million instead of 50 billion is by keeping the Africans uh, away from modernization, away from access to the world, away from access to any other market. And when Borel said, uh, we live in a, in a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle, he thought that he's still living the period of the conquistadores because he's Spanish, and uh, he thought that this language can still be used today. He apologized the next day, well, two days later, because he said this is not what he meant, but yes, he meant it. This is why I said at the beginning, it's a mindset in Europe that needs to be changed. It's a mindset in Europe that we can no longer colonize Africa, is that we've stolen enough from Africa and the Africans are not going to allow us to continue stealing. Now we see in Senegal, for example, in Gabon, they're still in good relationship with France and France still has uh, two, three bases, military bases in uh, Africa. The Americans have several bases in Africa. Uh, in Niger, they have the biggest drone bases in the whole of Africa. But it doesn't mean that the Americans will offer a reconstruction uh, uh, of the infrastructure because the Americans during one of the Congress hearings said we cannot compete with China, we can compete with in one or two places, but not in the 54 countries of uh, nations of China, of, uh, sorry, Africa. So um, uh, we understand that the West did everything in its power to keep the African uh, under control because there are huge resources of oil and gas and minerals, all that is needed in Europe. In Europe, we don't have natural resources. The natural resources are in Africa, are in uh, the Middle East, are in uh, Russia, and they, the, we, I'm talking about the main uh, natural resources. And we had access to the Middle East, but we've lost it, and then we have access to uh, Africa, and now we're losing it. Now, People are learning from uh, their lessons and experiences by watching what's happening, by watching how the world is behaving, by watching how the US and its European allies are behaving. And this is why the African today are rejecting the French, because France was, instead of changing its attitude and adopting a different policy and talk to the junta and talk to them about what are their plans and try to see how they can do the, it. Macron did exactly the same in Chad, but because the, uh, the uh, leader, the new leader, military leader of Chad was in good relationship with France, then immediately the coup d'etat in Chad was accepted. Um, uh, in Gabon, it was a coup d'etat, but then uh, France understood that the new general is not against France and say, oh, it's a family matter because he's related to the mother and it is the same family. We're not going to interfere and the election were not very democratic. So we find stupid excuses that nobody's going to buy today. Well, when in Gabon we say, oh, it's okay, the coup d'etat is fine there. And in Niger, oh no, that is uh, not accepted. And the democratically elected 
president should be reinstalled. So this double standard and hypocrisy is no longer something that we can get away with. And this is why we see the African are saying to the European, you asking us to kick out the Chinese, what have you done to us? And look what the Chinese are offering to us. You want us to ask Russia to leave? Why? Do you, have you offered anything? Have you done anything to Africa? Well, the answer is no. That's why when European leaders or ambassadors uh, talk to the African uh, president and people in charge and decision makers, they feel embarrassed because they can't continue the sentence for one reason, because today the African leaders are contesting and are replying because they have the alternative. Well, I, I think it's uh, pretty apparent of that that there's a level of control that Europe has lost, um, but there has been a concerted effort, especially by France, to uh, maintain control politically within the African states. Um, I, I believe that they are responsible for more assassinations and coups uh, through covert actions than than any other country that is operating externally to, to Africa, meaning, meaning the neo-colonials. Um, what is your take on covert actions? Do you, do you believe that um, there are any, uh, well, let's put it this way. There, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of different countries. There's a lot of um, mi paramilitary groups that are operating in Libya and in Ghana and um uh, Eritrea, other places. Uh, do you believe that these are Western-backed? Um, uh, depend which country, really. If we talk about Libya, um, that's so painful. I've been in Libya during the war, and uh, when uh, before the before NATO bombed uh, Tripoli, and uh, after with the fall of Muammar Gaddafi, and in Libya today, we see a torn country completely destroyed, was one of the richest country in Africa. All the plans that Muammar Gaddafi had to create a golden dinar, to uh, uh, create the African bank, to re replacing the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and all the uh, finance of the small businesses and uh, giving loan to African countries to boost their economy, make them less dependent on the West. So all that created a war where NATO destroyed Libya. And then today we have the paramilitary in different parts of the country, where, uh, including the jihadists and the takfiri of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, where they are two different groups, uh, and they are enemies. But they both uh, create havoc in the country. So, um, uh, yes, paramilitary are in uh, Libya. They are in other countries where some of them uh, protect the uh, wealth, like in Sudan, in uh, uh, Niger, in other countries, in Mali, in Burkina Faso. But I don't think they interfere today in coup d'etat because the uh, African people today, they are more aware what they want. And uh, they, there, there are coup d'etat in Africa that have been uh, some, it is something that is used in Africa for the last 30, 40 years, and not something that is going to stop until they find a certain balance. And the certain balance is the prosperity of the country and the lack of corruption. So I don't think it's only due to the paramilitary that are in the country, uh, but I think. Uh, the uh, African themselves uh, have to reach a point where they have in uh, internal satisfaction of what they have and they can uh, prosper the country by allying themselves with other states that are not going to steal them and going to work in supporting the African continent or at least individual nations. And we see big countries like, for example, in Nigeria, uh, has excellent relationship with the Americans, but it is one of the biggest countries and it is it has stability. However, the problem are always the jihadists and ISIS. And I think that the reason why the Americans and the Europeans are not getting rid of ISIS 
is because it turned out that it's a very good tool to be used, particularly in Iraq after the experience of Iraq and then Syria. And if we remember General Mike Flynn, who said that he reported to President Barack Obama that he saw how ISIS was growing and is going to move to Syria and Obama did nothing. And that is why ISIS has been transformed uh, to uh, a gun for hire when uh, Donald Trump removed them from Syria to Afghanistan to fight the Taliban. And uh, ISIS is in Africa and the Sahel, and they also there not to be completely destroyed because they also have a purpose. And the purpose is the Americans are saying we need the biggest drone base to fight ISIS and to help you fighting terrorism. We need the French say we need to continue our military presence to fight uh, the Takfiri and ISIS and Al Qaeda. And uh, they have bases in different countries. But if you look at geopolitics, like in Djibouti, for example, they have a base not because of the Takfiri and the ISIS, it's because it's the access to the Red Sea and it's a very important uh, maritime passage that everybody is there. So this is why we see there is um, uh, a kind of uh, misuse of the power in Africa by the military and the paramilitary, but I think there is a wake up call in Africa that's going to take time. It's not going to happen from one day to another. Maybe they need 10 or 20 years, but they're already on the right path. Yeah, I, I remember um, distinctly, there was a lot of discussions in the US Senate uh, regarding the funding and arming uh, training of rebel factions within Syria. And um, it was exposed that, that you know, a lot of their equipment was going actually to ISIS and to Al-Qaeda. Um, and if you'll remember, Russia, uh, when it did finally enter into the Syrian theater, within three months was able to um, reclaim, I believe it was about 70% of the territory that um, the Syrian government had lost to ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Um, and, you know, that's three months, whereas the U.S. had been there for three years and uh, was unable to to do that. So I think it, it kind of exposed that it, it was just more about enabling the uh, rebel factions and ISIS and Al-Qaeda just in order to keep the Syrian government um, in, a, in a state of turmoil and loss. Well, um, if you look, if you're talking about Syria, we see today that the Americans are based at the crossing between Syria and Iraq on their 10th, and they are present in, yes, 23% of the uh, country in the northeast Syria. And this is where they train the jihadists. And this is why we see ISIS attacking the uh, Syrian army convoy uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the desert. Uh, and because there is a, the desertic area between Palmyra and the Iraqi borders up to the north to a tenth and then to Bukamal, all this area is under the, the area of a tenth is under the control of the Americans. And within 50 miles, no forces can be allowed to cross. So what they do is they train the jihadists there, and these jihadists go and attack the Syrian army for no purpose. It just uh, uh, to create havoc and insecurity, but there is nothing strategic. And when the Syrian army wanted to get rid of ISIS once for all and cross the Euphrates river, uh, river we've seen how the Americans uh, attacked the uh, bulk of the forces killing 100 uh, Syrian soldiers and around 200 of the Wagner group that were um, were based in Syria and uh, fighting against ISIS uh, because they did not want anyone to cross the Euphrates River. And when the Americans are saying we got rid of ISIS, so why on earth are you still in Northeast Syria? For one reason, that uh, this is what Donald Trump said, he said, I want the oil. So basically, the Americans are stealing the oil. There is no reason uh, to stay there but because of the oil. They're preventing Syria from 
having access to its food basket because the Northeast represent the biggest part of the food basket for Syria, to prevent the commerce between Iraq and Syria and make it more expensive because the TANF is a, a shorter road than Al, um, uh, than Al Bukamal in the north. And I've, I've done this road many times when I was covering the uh, war in Iraq. So I know it very well and it's very a uh, short way to Baghdad. So to, to cut this road and to prevent the Syrian army from recovering the control of the area and to continue threatening the Syrian army and all the population that live in that area, because there are many people who used to live there no longer now because they are afraid uh, and ISIS always look for isolated and vulnerable places to just make the news. And all these under the uh, watchful eyes of the US drones and the military who are in control of the area. So basically, what they've done three things. They said, we want to uh, end the Iranian influence in Syria. And thanks to the US, Iran grew its influence in Syria because it helped the Syrian to maintain uh, the central government and prevent it from falling. Uh, and uh, Iran would have never dreamt of having a foothold in Syria like today due to the American mistakes. It's exactly the same Edom, I would say, in Iraq and Yemen. Secondly, they uh, forced uh, President Putin to send its air force to Syria because the uh, all the jihadists said, the first thing we're going to do is to close the Tartus naval base that... Uh, belongs to the, under the control of the Russian. So Russia was saying, well, I'm not going to lose uh, the base there, and I am not going to allow an ally like Syria to fall in the hand of jihadists because they are supported by NATO and the Americans. And Joe Biden came out and said, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, but he didn't say America, because the two main military uh, operational room were American operation room in Turkey and in Jordan. So he blamed everybody else and saying they wanted to support the Takfiri, Al-Qaeda Al and ISIS, and they invested billions of dollars. Well, all that was a waste, again, like it is a waste of the investment in Ukraine today, and like the waste of $2.3 trillion in Afghanistan. Well, the Americans are very good in spending so much money on war and getting no result because there are no accountability but not spending enough on their own people. So what's happening today in Syria is the lack of stability is due to the presence of the US in the Northeast. Of course, Turkey is also in the Northwest, but Turkey would leave if the Americans leave. But I don't think Joe Biden has any intention to leave until the end of his mandate. Do you, do you think that, um, just you just reminded me that there's, uh, the the Turkish government looks upon the Kurds as uh, terrorist factions. Um, do you, do you think that uh, that it's maybe the the conflict with the U.S. over Syria is just over the Kurd issue, or do you think it's something else? And also, how does Israel play into this? Because throughout this uh, confrontation between Russia and Ukraine, it hardly makes the news that, you know, at least biweekly, missiles are sent into Damascus from Israel. Well, you ask uh, five questions in one short. <laughs> <laughs> we have time. We have time, though. <laughs> So first of all, uh, the the uh, Kurds in northeast Syria call themselves the PKK Syrian branch, and the PKK is on the European and American list of terrorism. However, they are the best European and American allies in northeast Syria. Don't try to understand; it's a waste of time. So uh, they are considered today the biggest U.S. allies. This is why they don't want Turkey to uh, see them disarmed. Turkey would have agreed for the Syrian army to take over the northeast Syria and to control the area, but the Americans are preventing that. This is why it's giving an incentive for Turkey to say, well, these are terrorists, 
and they are terrorists by your own standards, therefore they, ha they are responsible for thousands of people killed in Turkey because they call themselves the PKK branch. The leaders of the Kurds uh, militia in Syria are uh, come from Turkey. They not uh, uh, they, the very small part are Syrian, but the biggest part are uh, uh, Turks from uh, Turkey, but they are Kurds uh, ethnicity, and uh, they are today uh, preventing the uh, Syrian army from having access to its own resources. However, they are selling Damascus fuel and they are allowed by the Americans to sell the oil uh, they produce also to Syria because the Americans steal the rest and smuggle it through Iraq and they use it in their military base and they sell the rest via Turkey. So uh, all this is happening in the northeast Syria. Now, why Israel? Israel in that is first of all, Donald Trump wanted to leave. If you remember, he said, this is a, a land of sand and death, and I don't want to be there. Uh, the American administration lied to Donald Trump by saying there are two, 300 men. There were 900 at least without the contractors. And uh, the Israelis were strongly against the withdrawal of the American in Northeast Syria because there are military bases and air bases in the Northeast Syria used by the Israelis whenever they used to attack Syria. Now, it is no longer the case because Russia put a limit on any uh, Israeli uh, jet flying over Syria because uh, of the uh, Israeli attitude against Syria supporting the war in Ukraine, uh, joining the uh, uh, NATO effort in the same operational room, offering intelligence, offering interception missile, uh, and being involved heavily in the war, in the Western war against Russia. Um, now, why nobody is talking about the missile launch against Syria? For a simple reason. The Israelis said they've carried out more than 1,500 attacks on the Syrian sovereign territory, violating international laws. People don't care about these violations because they are made by the Israelis. The, the, but why they do that is because Syria is not in a position to respond. If Syria responds to the Israelis' violation of its sovereignty, it means Israel can destroy uh, the Syrian infrastructure in the moment, at the moment now, where Syria is in need of finance and the need of reconstruct the country, the damage of 11 years of war mount between 400 to 500 billion dollars, all the Gulf rich country um, were prevented by the American from investing in Syria. And uh, the Syrian population is suffering from the lack of oil. Iran is bringing a uh, um, uh, a ship you know, monthly, but this is not enough for all the Syrian and uh, Iran and uh, Russia are trying to support as much as they can the Syrian population, but there is a limit for their support. You can't just take on uh, on on you as uh, Iran or Russia, uh, 15 to 17 million people. What this is the number that are still living in Syria today and then take care of them and all their needs. So this is why Russia, Syria has decided not to respond and not to engage in a war with Israel. Otherwise, Israel will bomb what remain and then will turn the population against the government in Damascus, although the government can't do anything. So the only thing that the Russians are offering is interception missiles and the Syrian army is hiding is effective under the ground. So what the Israelis are doing is they sometimes bomb the runway of Damascus airport and sometimes Aleppo airport. And then uh, these are repaired immediately after a few days. And then all the military effectives are taken from above the ground to under the ground to minimize the damage. And uh, the Israelis, every time they want to attract the attention of the world, say, look, I'm bombing Syria because I want to uh, make sure that Iran is not going to increase 
his military presence in Syria, which is really uh, nonsensical because Iran is expanding his presence in Syria because more the Israelis bomb, more the Syrians say to the Iranian, we need you to stay because one day you will help us to stop the Israelis from violating our uh, airspace and to make sure that all the jihadists and the takfiri and all those who are still in Idlib and are in the steppe are kicked out with your support. Uh, I don't know if we manifested it, but Israel is actually bombing Syria right now. They just started bombing the Tartus uh, base. Yes, they bombed the uh, harbor, and they've done that uh, uh, in Latakia many times. And uh, every time there are shipment of goods coming, uh, food and supplies, they bomb it to make sure that there is always a shortage in Syria. I'm glad you touched on that because, and and I don't think that people often understand the um, situation that Syria is in with basically being sandwiched between Israel and then whatever the United States and Turkey have going on in the north and then a surge in um, a surge in terrorist attacks kind of in central Syria and the fact that they're not the United States isn't taking the oil to help itself it's for only taking the oil to hurt Syria so I don't know. I mean, that my heart just sinks and really goes out to Syria. But how do you think about so question? So with BRICS, we do know that BRICS you can't um, you can't be in BRICS and observe Western sanctions against another BRICS member. So is it the same in the Arab League? Because Syria's reemergence into the Arab League has also seen an expansion of Iraqi and Iranian presence in Syria, which you already mentioned. So. Is, is is does the Arab League also observe something along those lines like BRICS? The only thing that the Arab League has done is to welcome Syria back. But it is not allowed to upset the Americans because the Americans said, you cannot support Syria. And the Arabs are saying, okay, well, uh, we go somewhere else and we deal, we have other options. It, uh, Syria uh, is not something that we're going to uh, tackle for the moment because the Americans have drawn a red line here and we don't want really to upset the Americans. So they turned a blind eye and they walked away, but they said, we love you very much, but we can't do anything for you. Do you see, um, I, I know that uh, groups like Hezbollah are involved in uh, Libya and Syria. Um, do you see the IRGC uh, expanding it, because it's in, expanding its influence inside of Syria, do you see them maybe having more of an impact in other regions uh, like Lebanon? Of course, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen uh, are the places where there are Iranian influence there. All that thanks to the U.S. intervention. When you cripple a country and then you have someone who's going to come and help you, the, this is what happened to Iraq in 2014 when Obama refused to supply Iraqis with the weapons that they bought and said to Nuri Maliki, Prime Minister, uh, we need still time to deliver the weapons. And he allowed ISIS to occupy all the north. This is where Iran stepped in and uh, supported the Iraqis. And the Iraqis will never forget that. Iran supported the, the Lebanese during the 1982 Israeli invasion, and they will not forget that. In Syria, they stopped the, along with the Russian, the um, failed state to be created, and they created a stronghold in Syria. In Yemen, exactly the same. The West and Saudi Arabia wanted to destroy the Houthis, and the Iranians supported them, and the Yemeni will never forget the Iranians. So wherever there is a really strong influence of Iran, it is always a U.S. failed intervention. I'm sorry, I have only one minute left. Oh no! Well, then let's 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 uh, let our listeners know where they can find you. Uh, it's on my Twitter account and on my blog, uh, ejmagnier.com, uh, for my articles and uh, with a um, an invitation to subscribe if possible. 
Please subscribe to Elijah. Um, Elijah, you're going to have to come back now because we're going to have to talk about the emergence of Iran. Okay, I'm all yours. <laughs> thank you, and thank you so much, Tyler. It has been another amazing episode of the DD Geopolitics podcast. Uh, the other half of the team is actually live streaming right now, so make sure you go to our YouTube and like and subscribe. Thanks, everyone, and until next time.